Good evening. Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Jonathan Deutsch. I'm a professor of culinary arts and science at Drexel University, and I'm co-chair with Robin Comita of the Culinary Literacy Center Advisory Council that supports the work of the Free Library's Culinary Literacy Center. As we celebrate the Lunar New Year, we can't think of a better way to celebrate that than with our speaker tonight, Grace Lynn. She is the best-selling author and winner of the Newbery Honor, the Theodore Geisel Honor, the Caldecott Honor, and is a National Book Award finalist. She's provided commentary for New England Public Radio and PBS NewsHour. Her most recent book is Chinese Menu, The History, Myths, and Legends Behind Your Favorite American Chinese Foods. She will discuss she will discuss that book and much more with our guest interviewer this evening, Ellen Yin, founder of High Street Hospitality Group. Ellen and her team operate some of the country's most esteemed restaurants and some of my favorite restaurants in Philly, including Fork, A Kitchen and Bar, High Street Restaurant and Bakery, The Wonton Project, and High Street Hoagies. Ellen was named Outstanding Restaurateur by the James Beard Foundation in 2023. On a personal note, I want to mention that in addition to her strong support for the Culinary Literacy Center, Ellen has been a great supporter of our food and hospitality management program at Drexel and our Drexel Food Lab, and a favorite employer of our students and alumni. Uh, please join me in welcoming both Grace and Ellen to the stage. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, it's the year of the dragon, um, and for those of you who don't know, the Chinese zodiac is on a 12-year uh, year cycle, with each year represented by one of 12 animals. Um, maybe, Grace, can you tell us what we should expect in the year of the dragon? Oh, okay. So, happy Lunar New Year, everybody, and thanks so much for coming out tonight. It's so nice to come out and see so many welcoming faces here, so thank you. Um, so this year is the year of the dragon, and probably um, most of you probably already know the story of the 12 animals of the Chinese New Year, but I'll try to encapsulate it just in case you don't know. So um, there's 12 animals in the Chinese zodiac, and the reason why is because a long, long time ago, uh, the Jade Emperor, who's like the king of all the heavens, had a birthday party. And he w wanted to have a really great birthday party, so he invited all the animals of the, of the Earth to come to his celebration. Uh, but between the Earth and where he lived was this huge, massive river, which was very, very difficult to cross. And so all the animals of the Earth had to try to figure out how to get across. And to give them kind of motivation, the Jade Emperor said, the first 12 to animals that get across that river and come to my party, I'll name a year after you. So of course, all the animals really wanted to become an honored animal and have a year named after them. And so, you know, like some animals like built a raft together, some animals like practiced swimming. Uh, but there was one animal who did not have to really worry about crossing that river that much. Uh, that animal was the dragon. The dragon did not have to swim in that water. He could just easily fly over it. And so you would think, because he could fly over that water, that he would be number one on the 12-year cycle. But he is not. He is number five. And that is because on the day of the race, they said, on your mark, get set, go. And he jumped into the air, and he was flying. He was easily beating everybody, um, easily beating everyone. Uh, but then he looked down below, and he saw some people having a drought. And they were calling up to him, saying, dragon, dragon, please help us. We're dying. We need water. And he's like, "Ah." Oh. I should help these people. So in the middle of the race, he went over, got some clouds, made it rain for them, and then he continued on, and that's why he's number five and not number one. And so uh, you probably know, like, in Chinese culture, they venerate the dragon, right? They love the dragon so much. And that's one of the reasons why they love the dragon so much. They think the dragon is very noble, very self-sacrificing. He's got all the, the, this is what they want a leader to be like, someone who is always going to place the needs of somebody else over their, their own ambition. And so, uh, but they're always up for a challenge, like, so they're good, good at that. So this year, 
is the year of the dragon. So it's the year of big changes, of big, big challenges. But for us to be successful in this year, we have to be, think like a dragon. And not dragon like Game of Thrones, right? See, like that's the, there's like the Eastern dragon and there's the Western dragon. And Western dragon is Game of Thrones, like this big ferocious beast, and like I'm gonna tear everything up and burn down villages, right? No, the dra- like the Eastern dragon, which is to think about uh, think about what you can do to help others, to think about, uh, to go through, make your decisions in the most noble way possible, uh, what you can, if you can make your decisions in the empathetic way, that's what will make you successful this year in the Year of the Dragon. Well, I love that. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, I always was fascinated with the Chinese Zodiac because every time I went to a Chinese restaurant, the placemat would have all the um, drawings of all the 12 animals, and we would look at every every person at the table's year and analyze whether they were the characteristics of it or not. I'm Year of the Snake, which is next year. How about you? I am Year of the Tiger. So Year of the Snake means that you, so I was talking about the 12 year, 12 animals of the Chinese New Year. And so the way the snake got across, the snake uh, was a very good swimmer. So the snake uh, was not really worried. He's like, I, I can swim, no problem. And on the day of the race, he jumps in, and he starts swimming, 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 and he gets about halfway, and he's like, ooh, this water is a lot rougher than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> it's like, this is really rough. It's like, and I'm really tired. I'm so tired, I don't know if I'm going to make it. And it's like, I'm so tired, I don't even know if I'm going to make it back. He's like, oh, no, what am I going to do? And, but instead of panicking, the snake looked up above and he saw the horse's legs swimming above him. So he wrapped himself around the horse's ankles and he hitched a ride for the, next, for the rest of the way. And so when the horse hit the shore, the snake slithered off and the horse went, oh my gosh, what's that? And the horse jumped back and that's why the snake is before the horse. So they say that the snake is very good under pressure. The snake does not, the snake, it doesn't panic under pressure. It's always very resourceful, always able to figure out how to make things work in tight situations, which is a very good characteristic for a restaurateur, I would that think. That kind of like me, yeah. Like my number one trait is uh, yeah. solving problems. So. Anyway, and uh, you said you're a year of the... I'm the tiger, which mm-hmm. is... Um, not a very good planner, <laughs> and takes a lot of unnecessary risks. Might might be true. <laughs> oh my God. Well, happy New Year. Um, you know, we were talking earlier today about all the different ways that people celebrate Chinese New Year, and I'm just curious. You know, when you were growing up, what kind of foods did you eat during the New Year? Oh, so I know we were talking earlier. So a lot of the foods that we we ate when I was younger are similar to the foods that you ate. Um, so, but the big thing that my mom always served at, on New Year's Eve uh, was the whole fish, right? And I grew up in upstate New York, where um, we were the only Asian family in the area. So I always felt a little strange about my identity. Um, and one of the things that really brought it home was when my mom would serve this fish, right? Because when you order fish at a restaurant, especially in upstate New York, it was like a little white square or a little pink square with like little herbs on top. It's like it was so pretty. But when my mom served the fish at Lunar New Year, it's like this big fish, <laughs> the whole fish with the tail and the eye and the eye staring at me. And I'm like, mom, why do you have to serve the whole fish like this? You know, like I thought it looked at, like now I don't think, now I think it's beautiful. But back then I was like, oh, gross, you know. And so, um, but she always served the whole fish. Uh, But that was really done on purpose because um, the fish has a lot of symbolism for Lunar New Year. Um, Because uh, the word for fish in Chinese is um, a homophone for a word that means abundance or wealth. And on Lunar New Year, what happens on Lunar New Year symbolizes how you'll be for the whole year. So if my mom came out on Lunar New Year and gave us a little white square or a little pink square, like I was saying, that would mean that we were only going to get part of our abundance or part of our wealth. And on Lunar New Year, you don't want that. You want the whole thing. So that's why my mom would serve the whole fish to make sure that we got all of our wealth and all of our abundance. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, when you think about all the foods that people serve on New Year's, I hate to say this, but a lot of them symbolize um, things like abundance, wealth, money, <laughs> money. Um, so we were talking about, um, you know, some of the things like dumplings. 
So um, I don't know how many of you know, but I have this little project called the Wonton Project. So uh, wontons, dumplings. What would the, what what's the symbol Sp symbolism behind the oh, dumplings? So the, the so we usually have fried dumplings at Lunar New Year um, because they are shaped like gold ingots. So gold ingots is an ancient Chinese gold coin. And so the idea being that the more dumplings you eat, the more gold coins you get for the year. <laughs> and we also serve like spring roll. The spring rolls have to be fried spring rolls, not the fresh ones. <laughs> the fried because those two, those look like gold bars. Uh, so because and like even the tofu, you you know we. We love tofu, but it has to be like the golden tofu, right? Like for Lunar New Year, you can't have the white tofu. The white tofu is not lucky. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. My mother was from Shanghai, so we had things like lion's head meatballs, oh. whole shrimp, eggs. Uh, eggs uh, symbolize, I think, um, wholeness, probably. wholeness in family yeah. and that type of thing. So um, anyway, well, I, I, um, I'm so honored to be here with you. Congratulations on all your accolades and um, for all your work working towards increasing Asian American representation and diversity in children's literature and, it, uh, um, and fighting against anti-Asian discrimination. Um, I um, read your book, one of 30 books, <laughs> um, and listened to your TEDx talk. Um, and I guess, you know, I, like you, grew up in a community that was largely um, non-Asian. And I could really relate to your story about belonging and what it felt like to be an outsider. So, you know, could you talk about where you grew up and what it was like growing up as a Asian American in a largely non-Asian community. So um, I grew up in upstate New York, and when I, I, I speak to kids a lot, and when I tell them I grew up in upstate New York, I'm very careful to say upstate New York, <laughs> because if I just say New York, of course they think I mean New York City with like the skyscrapers and all the different kinds of people, and I'm like, no, no, no. it's like where I grew up is like six hours away from New York City. Uh, there's no skyscrapers, and there was not a lot of different kinds of people. When I say that, I mean like there was no black people in my school. There was no uh, Latinx people in our school. There was the, we were the only Asian family in our neighborhood when I was in elementary school, and so that meant that I was always the only Asian girl in my class year after year after year, and the only other Asians in the school were my sisters. And so uh, it always gave me a really weird sense of identity. Um, uh, this afternoon, we were talking a little bit about how um, I don't speak Chinese. Uh, and one of the reasons why I don't speak Chinese, the, many reasons, but one reason is because since we moved to upstate New York, and you have to remember, this is a long time ago, um, uh, the school actually came to my parents and said, you know, please don't speak to them in Chinese. It might delay their language skills. And speak. So, so they only spoke to us in English. And so that set it up right from the beginning for us that um, our, at least set it up, for in, I shouldn't say for us, for me in my head, uh, set it up that my Asian heritage was kind of something not to be proud of. And so that was something that I really struggled with for a long time. I remember in kindergarten looking out and seeing like I was the only Asian person and feeling so uncomfortable about that. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm just gonna pretend that I'm not Asian. I'm just gonna pretend I look like everybody else in my class. And so that's what I did. And that's what I did for a very, very long time. Um, and it was only after, um, after I graduated from high school, after I went to college, that I started to realize what I missed by not embracing that whole part of who I was. And, um, you know, a lot of people think they, all of my books are Asian or Asian American, and they're like, oh, you must know so much about Asian culture. And I'm like, well, I kind of do now after I've done 30 plus books, but, um, <laughs> but I was like, but you know, I don't make, I didn't make these books because I knew so much. Uh, I made these books about Asian and Asian American culture because those are the things I wanted to learn about uh, because it was my own way of trying to reclaim that part of my identity. And it's, and I'm, I feel very, um, 
to, this afternoon I spoke to a bunch of seventh graders, and it was so nice to be able to say to them, you know, after doing 33 books, you know, I feel like I can proudly say that I am Asian American and really believe it. Uh, and that was a long journey for me. I could say I was Asian American, but I would feel like I was Asian on the outside, but white on the inside, because it took so long for me to feel like that those two identities were part of the same one, same person. Yeah, I think for me, my, my journey was probably ended up in the same place, but in a different way. We, um, you know, uh, grew up speaking Chinese in the household, but then as soon as we got to school, we were like, we're not talking, we're not speaking Chinese anymore, we're speaking English because we want to be accepted by everybody. And my parents would try to send us to Chinese school, and you know, th this was a huge thing because, um, you know, they wanted us to learn the culture so much, and we just kept rejecting it because we wanted to be you know, belong to the, the community at large. So different than what is going on today, in my opinion, because so many children right now learn multiple languages. Um, I mean, I'm shocked sometimes and embarrassed, I have to say, when, um, you know, there are younger children who are Caucasian who can speak Chinese better than I can. Yes. I mean, it's just kind of like <laughs> mind blowing, you know what I mean? So. Um, uh, I, I, I was thinking about something that you said in your TEDx talk about um, that you loved books and you were, um, you know, always reading books. I also was a huge fan of books and loved reading books too. Um, but you said that you never saw anybody like yourself in the books. Yeah. So, so. Uh, the, where I grew up in upstate New York, there was two things everyone knew about me. One was that I was Asian, because we were the only Asian family. But the other thing that everyone knew about me was I was the one that liked books. Uh, because I always was reading, I always had a book with me. I loved books so, so much. Um, and honestly, books felt like the friends, uh, like felt like real friends to me. Because like, you know, they were like the ones that I could really, uh, never felt rejected by, never felt like I had to be somebody special for them. But even in books, though, as much as I loved them so much and they were kind of like my home, they really weren't my home when I think about it. Um, because I never ever saw anyone that looked like me in a book. And I think about this so often now, how I, I would read books about unicorns and mermaids, and I would read books about wizards and all of these magical, enchanting places. Um, but I never ever read or saw anyone who looked like me in them. So even in books where like the impossible could happen, there was never anyone who looked like me. And I think that was something I always, always longed for and I always wanted. And that's kind of the hunger and that I've brought to my work, another reason why I do the books that I do. Well, I think one of the stories you told about um, wanting to be Dorothy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, really struck me that, um, in, I'll let you tell the story, but. Oh, yeah, so um, the story that I tell in my TEDx talk is how um, my fifth grade class decided to put on the play The Wizard of Oz, and all the girls in my class wanted to be Dorothy, uh, and me included, I was like, oh, yes. And so every day, all the girls, uh, on the playground who wanted to be Dorothy would sit in, would stand in the circle and we'd all sing somewhere over the rainbow practicing and practicing for the audition and then I remember on the day of the audition um, we were practicing one last time and I turned to the girl next to me and I said today's the audition do you think they might choose me to be Dorothy and the girl turned to me and she said but you can't be Dorothy Dorothy's not Chinese and when she said this I remember feeling so devastated, and not just devastated, but stupid, right? Like, like now when I say that, like people are like, weren't you angry, weren't you mad? I was like, no, I felt like she was right. And I was like, how stupid I was to think that I could even have tried out. Why did I, I'm so dumb, why did I even think 
that I could try out to do your Dorothy. And in fact, when they called my name for the audition, I just said, no, no, no. And I didn't even try it because I thought it was so Aww. stupid that to think that I could have even wanted, like, to, that they would even think about it. Like, why even bother? And um, it's those kind of things that, um, as a storyteller, as a person who makes books, that are really poignant to me because when I see my childhood and I realize that I never saw anyone that looked like me in a book, it made me think that I could never be a main character. I could never be the hero of a book, a heroine of a book. Um, if I was ever somebody, it'd always have to be the side character, but you know, or something like that. And uh, for me to make the books that I do, it's really just to show that, you know, uh, somebody who looks like me can be the main character of the book. And uh, that doesn't seem like it should be that revolutionary, right? It's like, like it doesn't seem like it should be that uh, big of a deal. But it, it really is, um, in more ways than one, um, I think it's important for... Um, it's important for kids who have not traditionally seen themselves in a book, and it's also really important for kids who have always seen themselves in the book to know that there are other people, other kids of, that don't look like them that can be main characters too. Like, it makes them look outside of themselves. I mean, um, we were talking earlier, um, my book, um, A Big Moon Cake for Little Star and Dim Sum for Everyone, uh, two picture books for kindergartners. Um, they're banned in Florida right now. And, and Dim Sum for Everyone especially is like very, I mean, it's just, it's really just my family eating dim sum, <laughs> right? And the only thing about these two books is that the main characters are not white. There's nothing political about it. There's nothing, anything, like they're just eating, you know? <laughs> like, and so it shows, like, like it's, it shows that even though it shouldn't be a big deal, it actually is. I mean, in some ways, the fact that they're getting banned shows how revolutionary it actually is in a weird way. Well, I was gonna ask you, since you're a mother, um, how, how have things changed? I mean, do you feel that things change, or is it still the same? Um, so Besides in Florida. <laughs> in Florida. I do think things have changed, and I really think things have, uh, in a lot of ways, changed for the better. I know we have a long way to go, and there's so many things that are... If we let ourselves, it's very easy to get depressed about the state of the world. Um, but I also think there's a lot of things to be hopeful for. Um, you know, like you were saying, there's... Kids, there are like white children who know way more Mandarin, who speak fluent Mandarin <laughs> better than I can, than I can, you know, like, and not only do they speak it, they, they're excited and they're encouraged. Mm -hmm. And um, the, like, I remember my, um, my daughter for, I think it was fourth grade birthday party at a friend's house. Uh, they had sushi, right? And like, and like, you know, they had like, you know, it was, you know, just like avocado sushi, just not, nothing really like amazing. But when you think about when I went to school, like sushi was weird, you know, <laughs> and now they're having it at birthday parties for right. like elementary school kids, you know? So like, I think there's, there's such a, a beauty to how we are becoming more accepting of, of, of each other's cultures and each other's identities, and I think that's really beautiful. Um, and I hope we keep going that way. Well, that's a perfect segue to food. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, um, in terms of um, growing up, um, was your mother a good cook? Was my mother a good cook? She was, you know, she's a much better cook than I gave her credit for. <laughs> I think now I look back and I'm like, I was mean. <laughs> well, you did know? she share recipes with you? No, she she doesn't. Sh uh, sh you know, she she does share. No, I take that. She, she does share recipes now when I ask. Uh, but you know, back then, um, she we, we would cook together. And I think about how she would cook. Uh, you know, it was always like. Um, We'd have rice, and it was always like five or six different plates of food on the table, you know, like a, a soup, a vegetable, a meat. And like now, as somebody who has their own family, I'm like, that is too much work. Well, I have to tell you, my mother, my mother would get up in the morning and start preparing dinner at like 
9 a.m. And I'm like, Mom, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I'm just like doing the prep for dinner. And I'm like, what? How could that be? It's kind of crazy. Yeah. And so like I it's only now it's like they they always say like you only appreciate your parents after you become one. <laughs> like, oh, oh, gosh. <laughs> like, well, I, really I don't know it. about you, but I <laughs> when I was growing up, I was under so much pressure from my parents to perform academically. Yes. And of course, I was a little bit of a black sheep because I was a creative person and I liked to go to art class and my father was a physicist and you know he really wanted me to excel in math and science and didn't understand why I you know wanted to open a restaurant and whatnot um, uh, you know as a as a book person you know I was just thinking if you felt the same type of pressure oh yeah and it was a uh, it's it's always so interesting um, because I was definitely a black sheep. I mean, I went to art school to the horror, <laughs> the absolute horror of not just my parents, but like all the relatives in the entire Asian community <laughs> of upstate Aww. New York. Um, so uh, it was, it, you know, to my parents' credit, they supported me the best they could. But like even to this day, I can tell they're like, they have like, uh, you know, what is it, post-traumatic <laughs> PTSD. PTSD from the whole thing, you know, because, um, you know, it's, it's a stereotype, but it's a, it's, I feel like it's a true stereotype because, you know, when I decided to go to arts school, um, so many Asian um, parent, uh, friends of my parents called up horrified, and they're like, I told my son that it's, uh, it's um, medical school or nothing, you know, like it was just like, and the, you know, they're like, how could you let your daughter go to art school? You know, and so it well, was don't like, feel bad. I, I said I wanted to go to the University of Pennsylvania and I said to my father, I want to open a restaurant. I want to go to the Wharton School because I want to open a restaurant. And he was just like, really? Are you sure? You could go to medical school still. It's, it's still okay. And I'm like, dad. <laughs> Um, I like but, how he was trying to comfort you, like, you could <laughs> still go to bed. <laughs> Don't worry, that the path is still open. <laughs> well, I still want to talk about food, sure. because in my family, my because my parents wanted me to excel so much in school, my mother never shared her recipes with me. Oh. But my youngest brother knows every single one of my mother's recipes. And I'm just curious, so, so you know, like, for Chinese New Year, my my brother can make the spring rolls. Oh. I, like if I make the spring rolls, and my mother came to our New Year's celebration, as you know, but um, you know, I asked her, how are the spring rolls? And she's just like, in Chinese, she said, you know, my mother has aphasia, so she can't say that many things, but she said bushing, which oh, means no. that it's not that great. And I was just like, but I followed your recipe. <laughs> so are there any examples of foods that you cook of your mother's that you shared in in um, the Chinese yes. menu. Yes. So the in so this book Chinese menu is a little unusual and people I always have to kind of explain it to people because they think it's a cookbook. And it's not a cookbook. Um, uh, it's a collection of stories. Um, so uh, it's I like to tell people think about it like you know those books of Greek myths where you learn about the origin of uh, Athena or Zeus or something like that. So this is the same thing, but you're learning the origin of Kung Pao chicken. <laughs> you're learning the, the origin story of uh, General Tso's chicken. So these are all the stories and myths behind uh, Chinese American food. But there is one recipe in here, and that one recipe is for my mom's scallion pancakes. Um, and so uh, that is because um, what my mom served at home was very different than the food that we had at a Chinese restaurant. And this, this talks about it a little bit, about how there is Chinese food and there's American Chinese food. And how um, it, in a lot of ways, when I was younger, I preferred the Chinese restaurant, <laughs> Chinese food. Uh, and so, uh, but it, the, this is not about what's better or what's what's worse. It's about how they all, they each have value. And um, But the one food that my mom cooked at home that was the same as the Chinese restaurant was the scallion pancakes. And so that's why her recipe for that is in there. Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> chi uh, scallion pancakes, my mother had a, um, uh, a quick version. Of course, 
you know, originally we would roll them out, we yes. would make them into, you know, a circle, and then we would, you know, roll them out again. But then she found a shortcut, and you're going to die when you hear this, because she would buy tortillas at the at the supermarket, uh -huh. and then she would um, put egg egg wash in between, put scallions, and then put another layer, and then like layer really? them all, <laughs> and and cut them. I I never saw her do anything that was a shortcut, but that was actually a That's shortcut. That's so interesting. Did they, did they still taste really good? No, they oh. didn't taste anything <laughs> like that. But um, but you know, um, she was such she was such a good cook, She's such a good cook. But I think you're right about the difference between Chinese American cuisine and traditional Chinese cuisine. How do you think, because, you know, every Chinese restaurant in the country has Kung Pao chicken. Mm -hmm. um, and it's pretty uniformly, like there is, I think that there is a recipe for Kung Pao chicken because yeah. everybody seems to make it the same way. How does that come, how does that happen? That is a good question. I mean, I think each restaurant is oh, probably has like a little bit of variation because of the chef in the kitchen. But I think um, what it is like, so there's a real Kung Pao chicken in China, you know, um, and the story of it is in the book. Uh, so what happened, I think for many uh, uh, in my research, what I found is what happened is a lot of what happened is the immigrants came from China and they brought their traditional recipes from China, their beloved recipes. And then um, when they tried to serve it here to uh, the Western audience, uh, they had to adapt it. Sometimes they had to adapt it because the ingredients weren't the same. So, and a lot of times they just had to adapt it uh, because uh, people's palates were different, you know? And so things became, so what was traditionally, I guess, Chinese food became American Chinese food. And um, the whole thing that I try to get across in this book is that that's not bad. It's just different. And I think um, this, um, a lot of people ask me, you know, what gave you the idea for this book? And uh, what gave me the idea for this book was because back in 2004, I did a picture book called Fortune Cookie Fortunes. It was for like first graders. But while I did that book, that's when I found out that fortune cookies was a completely Asian American invention that um, nobody in China knows what a fortune cookie is. <laughs> and so uh, when I told this to all of my friends at the time, they would all say, oh, so fortune cookies aren't even really Chinese. Oh, they're not really Chinese. And they, they'd say it with such a tone of disgust, right? And they said it so many times over and over again. It started to really bother me because I could really easily hear someone saying that about me, like, oh, she's not really Chinese, you know, and that made me feel really bad for the fortune cookie, you know, like, because, like, you know what, the fortune cookie is actually probably one of the first Asian American foods, purely Asian American food, uh, invented here in the United States, but with roots in Asian cuisine, right, and I said, that is actually something really cool and it's something to be celebrated and something to kind of honor and cherish just like how I feel like being Asian American is something to be to honor and cherish and that's why I kind of did this book about American Chinese food because I feel like um, we tend sometimes we are kind of snobby like it was not real like not really Chinese you know what like there's nothing wrong with American Chinese too you know like and there's something when uh, we should give this food more respect, and that's why I did my book. <laughs> well, I think it's really interesting because, um, you know, as a Chinese, uh, American-born Chinese, I think people don't realize where you fit in because you're, when you go to university, for example, there's Asians from China, and I don't know how you felt, but like, you know, when I, when I went to college, I didn't feel like I fit in with them. And then I didn't, I didn't really feel like I fit in with everybody else. And so you're just always trying to figure that out. And I think that um, with Chinese American food, it is grounded. I mean, it is something, it is, a, it's the Chinese American diaspora, as you yeah. described it. And uh, I think that that's really interesting. Um, so um, I know that you had been working on this project for a really long time, and um, when COVID hit, that you really just made the decision to um, 
finish it or publish it or yeah. tell, tell us more about that. So, um, so like I said, uh, I had the idea in 2004 to do this book with when I was doing um, Fortune Cookie Fortunes, uh, but you know, I it. I, so I started slowly collecting stories. Like I'd hear one, my dad would tell me one, you know. And I just kind of collected it and put it away. Uh, but uh, it wasn't until during COVID and uh, the rise of um, Asian hate um, that really made me realize, like, uh, I need to take this book out and I really need to do it. Um, the thing that really um, got to me was during COVID, people abandoned. Chinese restaurants, right? Um, they they were like, oh, we can't go to a Chinese restaurant, uh, but they would still order and get delivered. Uh, you know, the Indian food. They'd still get in order, delivered uh, the the hamburgers and the steakhouses and all these things, and um, that really bothered me, especially because uh, knowing the history of Chinese restaurants and how long this cuisine has been here in the United States. And the truth is like, these Chinese restaurants that people are abandoning, they're, they're, they were probably there longer than that, that, that uh, hamburger shop that was across the street. And, it's, and the thing is, not only has it been there longer, it is just as American. And that was the thing that really struck home to me because I mean like as an Asian American during that time like walking down the street and people being scared of me or angry with me and I'm like I'm just as American as you you know like and it's the same thing with this cuisine it's like this cuisine is just as American as the hamburger place that you just ordered from and uh, the hope is with this book to show and remind people that. Well, I felt similarly, and that's why I created the Wonton Project. But I couldn't believe it when I read your book that um, wontons were the basis for world creation. <laughs> so maybe you could finish us out with the story behind the wonton. Sure. Okay. So, uh, so wonton soup is like one of the biggest comfort foods. Every restaurant usually has wonton soup. Uh, we call wonton soup wonton because the first immigrants that came here to the United States were Cantonese, and they pronounced uh, uh, that dumpling as wonton. Um, and if you see the etymology of the word, um, it actually uh, looks like the words, it actually sounds like it's saying swallowing clouds, which is a really lovely way to think about your soup, like the dumplings are these clouds, and you're swallowing them. But if you look even deeper into the etymology, uh, you'll see, and you don't have the um, Cantonese way of speaking, you'll see that these, the word dumpling actually um, is talking about, an, it, says, it also means something called the primordial chaos. And that is actually referencing the Taoist creationist story. And so really, uh, wonton soup is the story, is a Taoist creationist story. And I'll tell you that story. Okay, so the Taoist cre creationist story goes like this. Um, before there was a world, before there was a universe, before there was anything, before there, the, before there was life, all, everything was a soup. This kind of murky, uh, cloudy soup. That's all there was. And then after 18,000 years of this, this cloudy soup, a white, round, egg-like thing congealed in the center of this soup. Now this egg-like thing was very much like an egg because there was something inside it, but it was not a bird. It was actually a giant. And this giant was growing inside this egg and then one day he did not, he woke up and he did not like being in this egg and he decided to break out of it. And so he pushed the top of the egg up above him and he pushed the bottom of the egg below him. And every day he grew like 10,000 feet and he pushed the top of the egg further away from him and he pushed the bottom of the egg further down until finally, every day as he grew taller and taller and taller, these two halves of the eggs could never ever join again. And the top of the egg became the heavens, and the bottom of the egg became the world that we know. Now, after another 10,000 years of pushing these two pieces apart so that they could never join again, uh, Pangu, the giant who came out of the egg, uh, fell over and died. He was tired. <laughs> and as, but when he died, he, his death gave 
everything on earth life because it was his uh, blood that became the water and the rivers of the earth. It was his hair that became the trees and the plants of the earth. One of his eyes became the sun. The other eye became the moon. It was um, his bones that became the mountains and the rocks of the earth. Uh, this one might give you the heebie-jeebies. They say it was the, the lice and fleas in his hair that became the animals of the earth. And they said it was his soul that became the people of the earth. And so it was his sacrifice that created the life on earth. And so when you eat wonton soup, you're actually kind of recreating this creationist story. The soup, the broth, is the world, is, is what the world was before there was a world. And that dumpling, that white dumpling, is that egg that Pangu is inside of. And when you crack open or break open that dumpling, it's just like Pangu. You are creating the world. So that's what it is when you eat your wonton soup. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody needs to eat some wontons. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, the question I guess I have is that wherever you go, um, in other countries, you always see different takes on Chinese food. Like you said, um, it you know has a lot to do with the ingredients and blending their cultures. Um, and I saw that movie um, in search of um, General Tsao, uh -huh. which I guess you probably mentioned in the book. I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, upon in your both of your travels, what's the most unique version of a fusion um, in a country of, for Chinese food? Oh, you first. Well, I, actually, last year I was really curious about that. So I, I was in Italy, and I, had, you know, I always pass by the Italian Chinatown in Rome or Milan, and I was just like, I'm going to try one of these. And um, my friends ordered almond chicken, and um, it was completely different than what. Uh, first of all, I don't know that I really ate almond chicken that much, but it was completely different from what. Um, I envisioned it to be. It was like kind of um, battered and then um, covered with like sliced almonds. And it was just fascinating to me because first of all, all these Italians, all these Chinese in Italy speaking perfect Italian was like mind blowing. <laughs> so I, I, I actually had to communicate with them either in Chinese or Italian and I couldn't, you know, like I don't speak well either one, so it was kind of funny, but yeah. Uh, could you tell us about the origins of General So? Sure, okay. So the General, General Tso's chicken has got a very complicated uh, origin story. Uh, so some people say that it's called General Tso's chicken because, um, because General Tso cut up his men just like they cut up the slices of the chicken <laughs> but um the, and there's like so many different or ideas and like i think eileen low um she says it was like something it's got roots in something called the ancestral home chicken but the story that's probably most true most likely like most likely true is the story that's in the <clears throat> documentary that you mentioned the sorry <clears throat> the searching for general Tso. And that story basically is, um, it goes into the, um, so hopefully you all know your, the, the history of China and Taiwan. Uh, so uh, China ta had a civil war, uh, though uh, Shai Kai-shek um, lost and came to, China, came to Taiwan, took over and declared Taiwan um, Republic of China, uh, United States saw Taiwan as the Republic of China. And so, uh, and they brought a lot of chefs over to Taiwan too. Uh, so while they were there in Taiwan, um, uh, lots of things happened and they were going to have a big state dinner, uh, which included a lot of uh, diplomats from the United States. And since they were having a big state dinner, the chefs really wanted to impress all these diplomats. So uh, this chef, decided he was going to make a new dish, a really great chicken dish that was going to be um, inspired by his hometown. Uh, and so he made this chicken dish. He's like, what should I call this chicken dish? What should I call this chicken dish? And he wanted it to be a, like a really powerful name. And so he's like, his hometown hero was General Tso. <laughs> so he's like, I'm going to name this General Tso. This is a, that's a, 
that's a good strong name. <laughs> and so that's how General Tso's chicken was named because it was the chef's hometown hero. Um, so General Tso never tasted this chicken. Uh, General Tso probably didn't even like chicken. We have no idea. <laughs> but, but it's named after him because the chef who created it uh, came from General Tso's hometown and wanted to name his dish something with the gravitas of his hometown hero. Yes, but in yes, and it is made. Yes, well, yes, and it was and it was created in in Taiwan. So, so that's why it's very it's very <laughs> complicated. It's created in Taiwan, and then uh, it's very complicated. And then the people from the uh, chefs from the United States came. He took it, and then they Americanized it further. And so, uh, the even. Even the General Tso's chicken that we eat is different than the original General Tso's chicken that they have in Taiwan. They had in Taiwan. <laughs> so uh, I didn't do a, as good of a job encapsulating that as I wished. <laughs> but hopefully, please read the book. <laughs> um, I'm curious to know when you have an idea for a story, how you decide what kind of book you're going to write. So I think one of the things that's amazing about you as an author is you have children's board books that my son loves, and then you have middle grade books, and then you have this book, and they're all so different. Um, so how do you decide what kind of um, story you're going to tell, what kind of book it will be? Oh, that's a good question, because um, I do write for all different ages. Um, honestly, it's usually the idea that decides what kind of book it's going to be. Um, I usually have an idea of what I want it to be, but that doesn't mean it ends up like, for example, I have an early reader called um, Lian Ting, um, and it's about these Chinese-American twins. And um, first, I thought I would try to do it as a picture book, and I tried for years and years to make it as a picture book, but it really wasn't working. Um, it, one of the things that um, I, I wanted to do books about uh, Chinese American uh, twins, but it kept instead of doing what I wanted, it kept instead of it kept making it seem like oh all Chinese people look alike, and I was like no that's not what I want, and so but it wasn't a, it wasn't a thick enough story to be a novel, and like slowly I realized oh this has got to be an early reader something that's thicker than uh, a picture book, so it doesn't have to have like. The, the weight, you don't need to know like their backstory and they're like, they're like, oh, their parents divorced and all these things, you know. So, but you don't need to know those things. Uh, but it's enough depth that I can get across the important things that like, they might look exactly the same, but they are not exactly the same. So, uh, so usually the idea figures it out for me. I would like to know what you're thinking now and how you would adapt or adapt or change things and maybe you should use some popular media like uh, opening a fortune cookie am I fortunate enough or <laughs> unfortunate enough I, I'm an anthropologist so uh, what would appeal to my taste if I was hoping for something metaphorically, but wrongly thinking about what it really is. Thanks, and, Barbara. <laughs> and, and imagination and creativity and maybe shocking people into opening something and saying, gee, I thought this was, but it isn't. What is it? Who is it? Uh, I don't know. I love Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Uh, uh, but I, I'm just thinking, how do we change stereotypes? And how do we make people from different cultures want to and think about differences? In other words, this doesn't taste like what I, but what does it taste like? I love that. Um, I, th I feel like um, one of the things that, um, I, and I don't know, I, I feel like food is a major connector to people. And that's why um, I love, um, you know, uh, I love what I do because food is such a major connector. I'm just curious, Grace, um, you know, when you wrote the book, did you think that this, how did you think that the stories would help um, move, uh, because you wrote it in response to COVID, um, how did you think that the, that the stories could help 
improve, um, uh, I guess, anti or reduce anti-Asian discrimination? So it, two, a couple of different ways. Um, one, um, some foods, it's kind of like what I said about, uh, we'd be like, oh, it's not really Chinese, right? So like some of them, like, I was like, you know, maybe they're not really Chinese, but that doesn't mean they don't have Chinese roots, right? Just like maybe I'm not really Chinese, but that doesn't mean I don't have Asian roots. And those Asian roots are still something that I cherish and something to be proud of. And there's something, and they're really cool. So part of it is to show that these foods that we, so they're not really Chinese, they have really cool roots. Like I think the stories in here are really fun. I mean, they've been child child tested, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and most of the, and and uh, it's most and, and it's they're fascinating stories. They're interesting stories. They're stories that you want to know about, and it makes you. In, I feel like it makes you enjoy your food more because you're like, oh wow, I'm eating the creation of the world. <laughs> you know, um, it, so not only does it do not only does it show the the roots of uh, the Asian roots that are really cool, I also think it brings a new appreciation to the food that we're eating. Hopefully, like I said, when you eat the wonton soup, it's not like oh, this is the cheap food that I just picked up, you know, from the fast food restaurant. Like, oh, this maybe it was cheap, but this has this long history uh, that that's really cool. It's like that I'm like I said, I'm eating like. This is like there was a great giant that cracked open and created the world. It's like, and I'm eating it, you know? So, like, it's that kind of thing. Uh, I'm hoping that these stories make people appreciate the food more. And with that appreciation, hopefully, if they appreciate American Chinese food more, hopefully they'll appreciate Asian Americans more, too. Well, I think on that note, that is the perfect... Um, <laughs> ending to our evening. Thank you so much, Grace. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. A beautiful book. And thank you all for coming out tonight and um, supporting the library and this amazing program. So thank you. It's been a pleasure to interview you, Grace, and thank to you. see everybody. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.